Once again, <coughs> good evening, Dhamma friends. Uh, we are going to have a Dhamma sharing about uh, the topic, as you can see uh, on the screen, digital detox, using Buddhist teachings to reclaim your time from technology. So when we discuss about uh, this topic, we have to uh, understand that uh, <clears throat> this is not uh, a talk that I uh, will be going to discuss uh, to talk the negative things about technology. Now we have to discuss that first. Number one is that we are uh, immensely benefited with the technology, even at the moment. We are using laptops, projectors, uh, then uh, what you call these uh, remote connections, uh, and many other things. So what we are going to understand overall is that uh, to create a mindful use, a wise use of the technology. That's the idea. Uh, in that case, we may need to do certain things. We may need to uh, uh, form certain good habits in using uh, technology, gadgets, and all that. All right, so I have some of the notes at the beginning. I'm not going to read all that. Is technology a mixed blessing? Uh, say, for instance, uh, it has uh, technology has significantly enhanced our lives. If you look at uh, 15 to 20 years back, you never wake up to an email to check your bills, right? You just woke up and uh, you just did your things. Maybe you had to go to the bank to pay the bills. Maybe you had to uh, go to the post office to pay the bills. I remember Brother Bobby was sharing with me when we were coming today. Uh, Many years back, I think probably 15 to 20 years back, uh, almost three decades ago, yeah, maybe late 80s, when you were part of forming BGF at that time, uh, you had to uh, get the signature of some of the officials to, uh, you know, uh, pass certain things. At that time, you had to go to their houses. There are no digital signatures, but I think you happily did that. <laughs> so it's a different type of uh, thing <clears throat> that uh, uh, people enjoyed. But now we have to go by the conditions. So that's why we have to understand that it is not a problem with the technology. Technology was there even at that time. Even in uh, 70s, 80s, uh, even in uh, uh, even in uh, uh, in those uh, decades, uh, the technology has uh, taken uh, different shapes, right? So I think you may have been uh, uh, changing and then working with those things. So we don't have any problem, but the problem is here, uh, while technological advances have undoubtedly made our lives more convenient, uh, they have also become sources of stress, particularly in an era when social media amplifies toxic uh, divisiveness. Despite their promise of freedom, digital devices often end up ensnaring us, increasing our stress rather than alleviating it. So that is a problem. It is something where we are going to uh, discuss things. Going back to the topic, digital detox. Are we detoxing in our uh, you know daily life? Where do you find this word detoxing, uh, detoxification in your daily life? Uh, it is connected to eating habits, food, digestion, right? We understand that we are consuming a lot of industrialized food at the moment. It's not that uh, food is coming right away. So the farmers have to uh, produce and the big companies have to buy and they may be uh, trying to uh, store uh, during that time, a lot of things are going to, uh, you know, work as a process. So finally, 
more or less we are consuming uh, certain toxic things right even from water right maybe some metals some unnecessary minerals right so uh, the word detox normally comes from this uh, life perspective to have a good life to uh, to sort of uh, uh, you know uh, drive away all these toxic things that we've been consuming in our life but the word has also been used to understand other things such as uh, uh, addiction addiction to uh, technology right so a digital detox involves taking a break from digital devices and online activities to improve mental and physical well-being. Now, we, we should not be misunderstood by understanding that we have to uh, have a long break because we, we cannot uh, spend time without these gadgets in the proper way. But we should understand uh, time to time we may need to have a break. What is the importance of a digital detox? As we understand, in a in our hyper-connected world, constant digital engagement can lead to stress, decreased productivity, and a diminished quality of life. How do we understand we have a problem with these gadgets and technology? Maybe not everybody is encountering this. Your experience, you experience anxiety or stress when you cannot find your phone. That's a good indication that we have this issue. That means we have a lot of uh, digital uh, uh, toxic stuff that have ensnared us. That means we cannot, uh, you know, live with, uh, without the phone. And you feel an urgent need to check your phone every few minutes, every few seconds. Checking, checking all the time. Right? Sometimes when you go uh, to eat with somebody, even in the uh, family gathering, you are always constantly checking on your phone at a time that you are not supposed, you don't have to check on. Nobody sending anything to you, right? <laughs> but you are trying to uh, checking on the phone just because it has been a compulsive activity. It's like eating, right? You had your lunch, dinner, breakfast, but you still want to go eat, right? This is the second indication if you have. You feel depressed, anxious, or angry after spending time on social media. This is for the most part of uh, the things that we see on social media. Now on social media, do we see the negative side of many people? No. All the uh, things that we see uh, come from positive, or maybe they are even exaggerating what they have. Maybe they take a picture of their food and then they edit the photo and then they publish it. And then you are not eating that kind of food on that day. Right? So this is one issue. So pe many people cannot understand how to uh, digest that kind of a uh, photo. What about someone who knows how to edit photos well? You know somebody and then suddenly you get to see a very beautiful photo, pretty handsome photo. Right? You don't know what happened. Maybe that person found out a nice app, 3D app. That person knows how to clear certain, uh, you know, things. All the freckles are gone, wrinkles are gone. Pretty bright, nice photo is on their wherever social media platform. You get very upset about how come? <laughs> I know this person, but you are going to believe these things, right? So that means you are not able to understand the online activities of people. You don't have to blame anybody. But when those photos and uh, sense media uh, are uh, on the platforms, we should be able to mindfully understand uh, these uh, videos, photos and all that. And number four, you are fixated on the number of likes, comments or shares in your social media posts. Right. This is a big problem to many people, right? Uh, <clears throat> they are putting up a very nice photo, like that kind of a photo as well. But not many people give likes to this photo. Not many people share this photo. And then you are thinking your 
uh, validation, your social recognition is dependent upon how many likes you are getting onto your photo, your video. Sometimes many people like something not is something that is unethical, something that is really unnecessary. Not many people like good things, good videos, good photos. Even if you look up on uh, YouTube, some of the uh, videos about health, well-being, not many people like. What about many gossip videos? Somebody's gossip, uh, it, it can be shared in an instant moment, right? So don't worry, right? But there are people who are struggling with this issue too. You worry about missing out on something important if you don't frequently check your device. That means you are so much addicted to your device. You feel that you are missing out on something. Are we, sup are, are we supposed to uh, follow each and everything in our life? We don't have time to time. We may have some time to check. Uh, some other time we, we don't have to take it as an obligation to check these things. Right? This also includes uh, other things like uh, other communication apps too, right? right? Finally, a uh, few other things. You often stay up late or wake up early to use your phone. This is happening to many people. When they are going to watch these videos, photos, they don't know uh, the timing. Sometimes it's very late. They can't even <coughs> stop it. Because let's say if you are watching YouTube, on the side of the YouTube main video, there is an auto suggestion. The similar videos are being uh, categorized by the YouTube. So they don't like you go from YouTube platform. Right? Even you watch any other app, they are doing that. Uh, there are other people. Not even they are late <clears throat> in their sleep, but also they are very early. Uh, they, are, they are trying to wake up early morning even to be on the track. There are times you may have to uh, stay up late for a special reason. And there may be other times you may have to wake up early in the morning for an online activity, maybe a uh, good activity. But this is something that is happening with someone on a regular basis. So it's going to be a really prob problematic thing because this person cannot even sleep. Finally, you struggle to focus on a task without the urge to check your phone. Let's say now you are supposed to uh, do a certain activity, <coughs> some activities, but you cannot do it without the phone. That's why many companies are asking uh, not to use the phones while they are at work. Maybe they are going to turn off the Wi-Fi. Right. So, and there are security problems too. Right. But there are uh, there are people who are working with uh, vulnerable information, sensitive information of people. So they are not allowed to bring the phone into those places. So, if you have one of these issues, maybe a couple of them, that means you may you might need a digital detox in a certain way. All right. <clears throat> What are the problems associated with excessive online activity and gadget addiction in more details? As we can see, it's clear mental health issues, sleep disruption, physical health issues, decreased productivity, impaired social relationships, impact on cognitive function, privacy and security risks, emotional and psychological dependency. So these are all issues that we have to understand. Uh, as a part of uh, too much uh, into gadgets and technology. I'm not going to read all that because I have to focus on the Buddhist aspect. As you can see, in terms of mental health issues, anxiety, stress, depression, attention problems, there are people who cannot even uh, uh, keep their attention even for a shorter time. Why is it? Because they are very much distracted they are they are getting distracted very fast why is it overuse of digital devices can lead to decreased attention spans and difficulty focusing on tasks for extended period so actually we we need we should be able to pay attention to 
the person to the thing that we really want. But this can be a problem that can come from mental health issues due to the addiction of uh, gadgets and technology. Sleep uh, disruption. <clears throat> I think this is a very big issue, especially when you are watching uh, uh, phones, checking phones uh, in darkness without the light. We understand that it can really interfere with the production of uh, melatonin. This is a hormone that uh, produces uh, sleep, a proper sleep, and it can uh, <coughs> slow down the production of melatonin, right? It's a hormone. So blue light exposure and sleep deprivation. Now we, you know, we understand that Buddha clearly told us if we really want to sleep properly, we should practice metta, right? This is one of the suttas where Buddha talks about. As a successful practice of metta only, you can sleep well. But when you are too much struggling with the gadgets and technology, you have no time to practice metta. Right? You are too much bothered about finding information by information. Sometimes unnecessary misinformation, not verified information. Physical issues, <coughs> health issues, eye strain, sedentary lifestyle, such as uh, <coughs> many other issues. Decreased productivity, procrastination, multitasking issues. Right? This is interesting. Impaired social relationships, reduced face-to-face -face interaction. I think when we are too much relied on digital devices, uh, technology, and all these gadgets, we are not even having a uh, uh, honest conversation with someone. Nowadays, many people have uh, digital friends. Right? Uh, of course, we all have. But are we having, have we been able to uh, make really truly good friends? This face-to-face uh, uh, -face interaction has been really, uh, you know, diminished uh, because of heavy reliance of the communication. If you can use these gadgets, technology, by understanding that I know when to st start when to turn on and when to turn off. And if you know, if you have that ability, then you are okay. But otherwise, uh, definitely, uh, your social relationships will be impaired. Uh, say, for instance, uh, you are not even talking to uh, your parents, your uh, loved ones, right? Nowadays, it's a big issue uh, for many parents to talk to their children. They are not coming out of their rooms, right? Uh, they only come out for their <laughs> meals, right? And then others have to prepare something for them when they come out. They are not even thinking about who is doing other stuff, right? And if they are really talking to them, they are getting mad. You know, you should let me do my things, right? So we have to uh, balance out digital, digital activities, uh, using of the gadgets and our relationships. We should We should understand that uh, these human relationships are very important uh, while we are maintaining uh, technological activities. Digital dependency. Overuse of gadgets can lead to dependency where individuals struggle to engage in meaningful conversations or activities without digital stimulation. One very good example is now we all would like to go check Dhamma even Dhamma online. But how are we going to really understand certain things? You think everything that has been fed on internet seems to be verified and truthful? I'm not going to mention about uh, some of the websites, but you are going to find out the information that have been already <coughs> fed by somebody. In terms of uh, uh, <coughs> what we call uh, uh, Dhamma information, especially suttas. We have a very big issue because uh, not many suttas have been properly translated. There are translations, but they have not been properly translated. Now say for instance, uh, I would take one very example. 
you take the sutta called attaka nagara sutta in the majjhima nikaya in this sutta it is said that venerable ananda uh, went to the temple called kukutarama it's a temple kukutarama many translations about this kukutarama uh, go by the monastery of the chicken feet chicken feet monastery kukuta means if you translate translate the pali word kukuta literally it is chicken feet but what is the meaning uh, if you are truly looking at it the temple monastery that was built by the minister kukuta now if you literally translate kukuta that way without understanding the context you are mistranslating now lot of such information have been fed on internet we have another uh, talk uh, some way i don't know when is that uh, it's going to be very interesting fake buddha quotes <laughs> something similar to this idea there are lots of quotes that have been shared by many people who have attributed all these all those quotes to the buddha some of them are very vulgar words by the buddha who knows how do we uh, ascertain how do we verify this information that's why when you go to certain medical websites somebody has to verify even you go to web md uh, cleveland clinic uh, and other website somebody has to verify uh, an expert on the subject that's why there are lots of misinformation so if you only depend on internet uh for information you have to be very careful there are times that you may not be able to find out the proper the true information so uh that's why while you are learning from internet time to time you have to approach the experts on the subject otherwise you will uh depend on digital things which might not be really uh truthful in understanding but definitely there are certain things that are really uh, interesting impact on cognitive function memory issues nowadays we see that many people cannot memorize lot of things if you can look at uh, even our younger generation and i don't know i don't know they have <laughs> yeah, i don't know i cannot remember why is it because they are not trying to nothing is going to uh, retain in their mind the memorization is very simple because they say no i can look it up on internet why do i have to memorize but the problem is not that yes we don't have to keep unnecessary information in our uh, head we can definitely if we have this we can go and check it up but the problem is if we have a, a cognitive uh, Uh, this function uh, then that is going to be a problem in our life let's say if i cannot remember uh, what has been happening my good stuff if i cannot remember about what my mother father my beloved ones have been doing for me i can't be grateful towards them even i cannot be practicing mindfulness so this uh, ability to uh, retention ability to have a certain retention about life and information is very important uh, because uh, that retention has been interfered by unnecessary addictions to the technology that's very interesting that's one of the very bad uh, effects of uh, technology uh, addiction to technology a memory issue reduce critical thinking very interesting this is the flip side of the other one the next other side of the coin now when you cannot memorize you cannot be critical about anything right now nowadays uh, you know there are many apps when you just uh, say hello please write me an article about industrialization and then the ai is going to write that that is kind of a help for us but the problem is none of the information has been uh, explored by the student that's why we see a, a big difference between uh, uh, our
previous generations and the new generations. Uh, the, uh, there is a problem. I, I'm not saying that everybody uh, doesn't have this critical thinking. They may have their own ways of uh, being critical. But in order to think critically, we must be able to retain some knowledge thereby to create some wisdom. So, and then you can see here, the ease of finding information online can sometimes lead to shallow thinking and reduce problem solving skills. I think these are very important stuff. Shallow thinking, not critically thinking. And reduce problem solving skills. Now we know when you are someone who can uh, have a lot of problem solving skills, many people depend upon you because you are such a very uh, uh, productive, efficient person anywhere in the world. Right? So uh, critical thinking is also going to be interfered by unnecessary addiction. But there are people who critically, uh, who develop critical thinking, who develop uh, memory skills while taking the use of technology and gadgets in the proper way, the mindful way. That's what we are going to look at. Privacy and security, this is a big issue. When you are putting all the information on online platforms, your everything, your, then what, what can happen is that there is a data vulnerability everywhere in the world. Scammers, right? hackers, right? they are always uh, on the alert in finding information. And I think most of our senior uh, people, they are fall prey to this issue because they are still getting used to this technology. Time to time they are getting emails, you know, um, we are going to give you a lottery, so you only have to spend hundred dollars. But what we need is your name and your email and your password of the email, just do a kind of a search. And then in a moment of time, your email will be hacked by that person. And uh, that hacker is going to send emails to your friends so and so is stuck somewhere in Uganda, Rwanda. I need five thousand dollars immediately. Please help me. Right. So that's why. So that means we need another layer of mindful use of this uh, data, right? Especially your own data. I think you are heavily relying on uh, paying uh, on apps, paying from QR codes, uh, online banking. It's good. But be very careful to protect your data in whatever the way. Not giving a lot of information to internet is the, is the best way. Keep your uh, proper information somewhere with you and then only uh, give uh, moderate information to internet. Otherwise, uh, this can be a problem. You are, you might be vulnerable. Uh, not even uh, you might be vulnerable. Even the very big tech companies are vulnerable. Anytime their data will be hacked even in those advanced technological countries, in a moment of time, right? Cyberbullying and harassment. If you are somebody who is always on internet, then increased online presence can make individuals more susceptible to cyberbullying, harassment, and online scams, right? I think it's good for all of us. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, when you are going to talk to people online who never know, they are going to blackmail you, they are taking things from you, and they are going to, uh, you know, harass you, cyberbully you, right? I saw Malaysia, uh, they are trying to ask all the tech companies to uh, register, I think, and uh, recently, I think there is a new engagement. It's a good thing, you know, so, uh, just to protect all these people. Emotional and psychological dependency. This is very interesting. FOMO is a very nice uh, acronym. Fear of missing out. Constant exposure to others' highlights and activities online can lead to FOMO, impacting your self esteem and overall satisfaction with one's own life. Now, you are someone, say for you are someone who is not posting anything online, but you are only checking what other people post. Then, after a couple of hours, couple of days, couple of months, you feel FOMO. You feel like you are kind of uh, missed out, you are kind of left out from the dialogue, right? So that means uh, you, you don't have to constantly expose to others' things, 
right? Instant gratification, right? This is another thing that uh, that is happening in today's world. Now everything has been instant. Huh? You order food on X Y Z company; it's very fast. Food is coming to you. You order products uh, uh, with those X Y Z apps, and gadgets will come to you. And then what will happen? People reject you, and you expect that rejection should be withdrawn in a moment of time. But people don't withdraw themselves by rejecting you. And there are people who are trying to blame you, criticize you. They are not withdrawing their nature of what they are doing to you. So with this technology, there's a certain subconsciousness uh, uh, mind that has been arising, creating within us that everything has to be instant. The immediate feedback and rewards from online interactions can reinforce habits of seeking instant gratification, which can be detrimental to long-term goal setting and patience. Nowadays, people are very, uh, you know, making quick decisions. Uh, we, we we may have to make quick decisions at times, but sometimes they are make very they are making quick decisions uh, in terms of very uh, big issues in a moment of time. Right. Even to think about a divorce, breakup, it's very, very short. They are not even giving some time to think about, to recover what's going on, right? Because uh, they are making their own understanding, they are defending themselves and they are, uh, they are justifying, uh, they are reading their own mind and then they do everything in a short period of time. So technology in that way has not uh, given you to think a bit about what's hap what's been happening because this great instant gratification All right so addressing these issues involves conscious efforts to manage digital habits so your digital habits have to be consciously done such as setting boundaries for screen time practicing digital mindfulness interesting digital mindfulness and fostering a balance between online and offline activities all right we are going to discuss them a little bit more if you are someone who is doing the proper things which we'll be discussing in a moment of time, then you have less stress, anxiety, you have a better sleep quality, and you have better focus and productivity. You maintain work-life balance, which everybody would like to have, better relationships, and increase mindfulness and presence, because you give time to understand what's happening, and allows for a more positive life perspective. If you are not addicted to internet, you are someone who has a very optimistic, whose uh, way of thinking life is very uh, healthier, right? Not many people can have that kind of a very positive life perspective. Uh, there are people, you may have heard that they are always complaining, whining all the time. You know. Why is it? Because they saw something on internet uh, to complain as such. So they are looking at everything through uh, what they have uh, seen unnecessarily. But uh, everybody is different, everybody is unique. And less social comparisons. When you are doing social comparison, it makes hard for you to be content. You can't find your own uniqueness. You can't find your own beauty. You can't find your own uh, wisdom sometimes. So you are going to lessen them. Connect into more real people. Right? We need real people. We need real connections uh, in life. We need Kalyanamitas in Dhamma life. We need uh, uh, good friends who are studying well. We need good uh, people who can work. Right? All that. All right. So these are some of the benefits that we can have. Uh, which are very interesting benefits that are really helping us uh, to become better people. Now we are going to look at mindful, mindful digital practices through the lens of Buddhist teachings. Number one. Now one thing that we are going to look at uh, this topic from Buddhism is that the happiness part. In Buddhism, Buddha always talks about that everybody deserves happiness. In that uh, discussion of searching happiness or maybe entering into that happiness the buddha talk about nibbana as the ultimate 
But before that ultimatum, he talks about different types of happiness. What are the happiness types which the Buddha discussed with us, <coughs> explained to us, especially as a lay person? Don't go to Nibbana in the, in the first place. What are the types of happiness that you can enjoy as a lay person according to the, the Buddha? The first happiness is Atisukha. Atisukha means Atisukha, A T T H I. Atisukha. Sukha means happiness. Atisukha means happiness of owning things, people in life. Are we happy when we own things? What are the things that uh, make people happy when they own? I would like to know. Huh? Uh, gadgets themselves, huh? <laughs> gadgets themselves. And then <clears throat> money. The more they own money, the happier more people are. And then loud ones. And huh? good health. So when they own many things, if you can you can go over and over, they are happy. So being able to own those valuable aspects in life is a happiness according to Buddha. It's not unhappiness. And the second happiness is Boga Sukha. B H O G A. Boga Sukha. Boga means now you have all things, people, uh, material things, uh, good health, if you are blessed enough. And then now, what, is, what could be the second happiness? Being able to enjoy what you have owned. That is also a very uh, difficult happiness to many people. They have a lot of things, they have loud ones, but they don't feel the company. And they have lots of uh, uh, money, but they are not able to enjoy that money. And they have lots of food in the house, but they are not able to eat before they expire. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> they have a uh, uh, couple houses, they can uh, happily stay in those houses, but the person chose to be in the very dilapidated uh, house. That is how that person's mind works. Buddha says that the, the problem to these issues, uh, the problem to that issue, why people cannot enjoy uh, what they have owned is, that they have done good karmas in past lives, but uh, how they have done it with lots of expectations. So when you make lots of expectations while doing good karmas, you will get them, but you will lose the interest to enjoy those benefits. Right? That's a little sad, right? You have money, but you don't know how to enjoy them. Right? And you see there is somebody who has <clears throat> a little amount of money, but that person enjoys life very well. So there is something to learn. So second happiness is being able to enjoy what uh, you have owned. Third happiness is Anana Sukha. Anana. A-N-A-N-A. -A -A. Anana Sukha means happiness of not having debt. Right? Happiness of not having uh, DEBT, debt. Now, in a world of gadgets, technology, uh, and a lot of developments in finances, can we live without applying for a loan? Can we live without, uh, without owning a credit card? Now, you know, lots of uh, shops have been cashless now. You can't even buy food. From a shop, they say we are cashless. You know, look at the message. <laughs> Notice, you have to pay by a credit card. But credit card money, is it our money or bank's money? Is it bank's money? Now, what is the problem? A lot of people think, no, I'm not going to get a credit card. Why? Because I will keep spending money. So we have to. Those people have to work on that problem, right? Because uh, you are given a credit card to wisely use the credit card. Not that you are going to overspend, right? 
So what did the Buddha say in terms of the happiness on uh, not having debt? You are trying to uh, balance out your income and expenses with whatever the loans, credit cards, mortgages, whatever the things, even uh, what you call uh, uh, other things, whatever the other uh, things that you can get, right? Uh, and you know that you can pay back. You know that you are going to pay in full. And you know that you are not going to misuse those things. Uh, but when you are overspending without understanding how to spend, how to use, then the Buddha says that is not going to be a happiness. So if you are someone who is using all these things, the new financial things, by understanding how to wisely use those things, then you, do, you have the Anana Sukha. Finally, Anavajja Sukha, A-N-A-V-A-J-J-A, -A -J -J -A. Anavajja means happiness of earning money, things ethically. At the end of the day, before you sleep, you are thinking, have I made money? Have I earned this thing in a lawful, ethical way? Or have I cheated on somebody to get this done? Have I commissioned in a bad way? Have I earned black money? So the Buddha said, this is not a happiness to us. So we have to be able to uh, always try to be ethical in our uh, income and also for expenses. So the happiness derived from enjoying a comfortable life through technology. If you are using technology for earning money, uh, you are using to create a life that is really Buddhist friendly. right? That is one thing to do. Constant delays in activities due to technology addiction can lead to a decline in diligence upper mother and affect our practice. Now when you are too much attached to unnecessary gadgets, then you are going to be behind many things. You are going to be late in many things. So you cannot practice upper mother. Diligent. Diligence is the root practice in the Buddhist teachings. We have to be always striving with diligence to increase <clears throat> our practice. Number three, being preoccupied with irrelevant aspects of life due to technology addiction can hinder our ability to make right efforts in our practice. Now when you are behind, then what can happen is that your virya, your energy, or in other words, your right effort will uh, fall apart. What is right effort? Right effort is the thing that we have to practice all the time uh, to enhance, to increase the Noble Eightfold Path practice, to uh, prevent inactive akusalas. That means, uh, say for instance, you are someone uh, who has no problem with that particular bad virtue. You are not a very angry person. You are not an angry person. So you don't have to be angry then. So you are trying to put effort not to become angry. right? So it's called uh, putting effort to prevent inactive akusalas, unwholesome things. Right effort, first part. Second part, to, uh, to put effort to remove the active akusala qualities. Now you already disturb. You have lots of bad things. When you are jealous, you are uh, impatient, you are annoyed, you are frustrated. Now you want to remove them slowly, gradually. So you need the right effort to do that. Third thing is, uh, it is said that you have to create, put effort to create new kusala activities. That means uh, you get to know somebody lately, you feel that that person appreciates other people more than you. He or she can appreciate life very well, but you understand you are not like that. Then you think, why not uh, uh, this quality uh, going to be a practice in my life? I'm going to uh, bring this uh, quality into my practice. So you are creating a new kusala and you are putting uh, effort onto that. Finally, you are going to develop, put effort uh, to develop your existing active kusala activities. You are already 
a very patient, very good person, kind person you are going to develop. Now, you cannot do this for if you are addicted to technology because you are not giving enough time for these four aspects in the Dharma practice. Number four, addiction to technology can distort our self-image online, fostering a sense of ego that undermines the practice of right view. Nowadays, you know, like people leave comments, reviews on Google, right? So they are uh, going to highly depend on, heavily rely on the reviews. Sometimes this can be a very violent activity to some people. I remember some time ago, there was someone who went to a, a car dealership and then uh, started uh, going for a test drive and then something went wrong and uh, she came back home and she left a, a comment about it, uh, a review about it. And then the, uh, the car dealership uh, repeatedly in, uh, you know, uh, intimidated her, you, know, you have to take out that review, <laughs> otherwise we are losing our dealership. So people are so much uh, stuck with the online image, right? So this can be a problem. This this might definitely create lots of ego, sakkayaditti. So we have to understand that too. Understanding how Buddhism interprets experiences, dhamma, and exploring methods to analyze and address them, sanya, vedana, and uh, sankar. What does this mean? What is an experience in Buddhism? How do we, uh, how do we uh, say an experience in Buddhism? Let's say you are creating lots of experiences. What is an experience in Buddhism? The Buddha says, an experience includes three things, sanya, vedana, sankara. Sanya means perceptions, a memory. Vedana means a feeling. Every experience has a memory. And every experience has a feeling. And every experience has a form of sankhara, good karma, bad karma. So we are struggling with our own experiences. Now when you are uh, <clears throat> too much into uh, this online presence and unne gadgets unnecessarily, you are addicted at that point, your experiences are really going to be messed up. You are not able to analyze the Sanya Vedana Sankara and then become a better person. Okay, let's look at some other aspects. Now, mindfulness. Now, one very important thing that Buddhism suggests is that uh, you can use definitely these gadgets technology, but use them with wisdom. That means you are mindful while they are, you are using those gadgets. This mindful means that you know when to start, when to turn off, and how long you're going to be in that. So you have a very good mindful uh, uh, networking, uh, framing about whatever the activity you are doing so that you are not going to overuse any of those digital devices. At the same time, um, using change as motivation. Now, technology uh, is something that gives us anicca all the time, isn't it? The concept of impermanence, right? The concept of impermanence is one of the very imp important things about technology because what we saw uh, in terms of gadgets last year uh, will not be the gadgets that we are using this year. Uh, all the things are going to be changed, upgraded. Uh, even you take the phones, uh, wires, cables, softwares. So we understand this uh, while being interested about these changes, we are understanding this as a, uh, as, uh, as a point of anicca. And at the same time, we are using anicca to understand uh, this as a motivation to stop unnecessary uh, use of technological things too, while understanding the updates. And anatta, understand that true happiness stems from inner contentment rather than material possessions of constant digital engagement. Right? So we are, we are looking at the use of technology, especially addiction to technology uh, from another concept. That means we are uh, supposed to understand that 
you can't say that nothing is I, me, myself at the end, at the end. So that will help us to wisely use these gadgets. Finally, uh, if you are not properly understanding these uh, aspects of uh, uh, addictions, then what will happen? You might end up with lots of dukkha, such as uh, craving for perpetual digital stimulation leads to lots of dissatisfaction and distress as it distracts from genuine fulfillment. So, a lot of dukkha can be formed if you are not wise enough to uh, use them. And if you can, if you, you can integrate the practice of Noble Eightfold Path in a way, how? Apply the principles of the Noble Eightfold Path, right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right living, right effort, then uh, right mindfulness and right concentration to guide mindful technology use, minimizing deviations and ensuring technology serves as a tool for personal growth rather than addiction. So we are bringing lots of factors from Buddhism to use gadgets and technology in a uh, way that we are not addicted to these things and we are wise so that we can keep up our good nature of the life. Steps that we can use to uh, uh, detox digitally uh, in a successful way, set boundaries, uh, screen times, we're going to definitely uh, set times for screen times. And sometimes uh, we might need to create device free zones like uh, such as eating time, bedrooms, family time, so it's good. So we are making time for those activities. Mindfulness, as I uh, explained earlier, and regular breaks. It's very important to take some breaks weekly, uh, time to time, so that you are going to understand that uh, you have a habit. Uh, I think nowadays, even the digital uh, gadgets, they have their own apps to check screen time. How much screen time that we are using for Facebook, for uh, WhatsApp? For internet so we understand we can track our use uh, I am using uh, 50 hours for this particular app which is not good and you are trying to think about this is not a good idea so I have to minimize it I do whatever the right things with that and I'm gonna uh, set aside uh, other time for my good things my real life right uh, as you can see, use apps to track your usage. Uh, disconnect at night before bedtime. Uh, people who are continuously using and turn off the notifications. So in this way, we understand that uh, 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 we can look at uh, 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 use of digital gadgets and technology from a Buddhist point of view. What I suggest is that uh, you need to wisely use them. You need to mindfully use uh, these gadgets. Uh, only when you use mindfully these gadgets, you are understanding that you are not going to overspend on these gadgets and technology. You are really getting things done uh, as you need it. So that you are uh, time to time detoxing this digital, uh, what you call addiction. So then you are going to be someone who is not controlled by your gadgets rather you are going to control manage these gadgets at the end that is how we are going to think about uh, uh, the buddhist attitude even if you are someone who is overly uh, spending time uh, on uh, internet gadgets for buddhist things it doesn't matter the subject uh, it, it might really create some problems that's why uh, it is on the part of uh, misinformation and perhaps addiction to the gadgets and you are not really feeling that your practice is uh, going well. So use gadgets technology wisely. Uh, time to time uh, create your own habits of taking breaks from these gadgets and technology. Never ever heavily depend on these uh, gadgets and technology. Rather use them for collecting some information 
and find out true information in another uh, or in other proper ways as well. All right. So, any questions about uh, uh, this topic today? And there's a mic, uh, Brother Bobby can give. Any questions? Raise your hands. I pass you the mic. Hi, Bante. Um, good evening. Um, can Bante, Bante mention about the um, Buddha's words on happiness, the four types of happiness? Of course, uh, you actually uh, verbalize what are those, uh, I believe it's suttas, and you also spell, but I, I wasn't having my phone. But perhaps I think it's a shorter way. Can you give provide the, the reference number or, you know, so that we could just do a quick check yeah. after this? to read the entire thing. Thank yeah. you. It is given in the Anana Sutta. Maybe we can find it out. Yeah. This is the Sutta. Yeah. Anana Sutta. AN 4.62. Yeah. That was Anutra Nikaya 4.62. Okay. Is it, is it all here or? All the four. Oh, yeah, all are here. Okay, thank but you. But the sutta's name was given with the third happiness. So, uh, if we, if you can look at it here, what is the happiness of having? Ah. See, there is the case where the son of a good family has wealth earned through his efforts and enterprise. Uh, I think this is a little bit heavy translation. <laughs> we'll take another one. So that's why we have to change time to time you now. Listening okay. to your clarifications just now sounded so easy, right? Yeah, now so that's reading, why, that's right, why I'm telling like, you, the translations uh, sometimes more complicated as more. Okay, this is a little better. Householder, uh, these four kinds of But they, sorry, can you enlarge it a bit? Cannot read from here. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe from here. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, same sutta. Six. Householder, these four kinds of happiness can be earned by a lay person who enjoys sensual pleasures. Depending on time and occasion, what for? The happiness of ownership and using wealth, deathlessness and blamelessness. Now, one of the problems is that when uh, you read a lot of Buddhist teachings, uh, you always get the idea that there is no happiness of enjoying life, right? This is what many the, books... Uh, the misconception uh, of sensual pleasure is... I wouldn't say it's wrong, but it's something that we should not... not we should not <laughs> learn to accept... <laughs> I, I, I can't find a better English word. It's like don't get attached to it. No. So it, when we say that sensual pleasure is something um, we ought to learn lay person as we cultivate, learn not to attach because that is the suffering, the cause of suffering. So because of that, right, automatically this mind will think that stay away. Then become so regimented. When you become, I mean this mind, I can only speak to this mind, right? When it becomes so regimented, right, sometimes when you just pull the string too hard, it got backfire and then you just, oh, enough, fed up. So that is, the risk that I am looking at. Okay. Yeah. But uh, when you look at from the Dhamma wise, it is not the attachment. When you can't enjoy sensual pleasures without being attached. It is the greed. Don't bring greed to the sensual pleasures. 
that's what the Buddha said. Okay? Uh, even in the Metta Sutta Buddha says, Tittincha Anupagamma Silava Dasanena Sampanu Kamesu Vinaya Geda. You have to dispel the greed in regard to the calm, sensual pleasures. So you cannot enjoy any of the sensual pleasure without attachment. We have a definitely an attachment to sensual pleasures and the people uh, in that process. But don't bring greed. What is the difference between greed and attachment in the Buddhist context? Attachment is uh, when you enjoy sensual pleasures, you are relating that happiness uh, to you and to the person or the particular thing. But uh, how do you bring greed? The moment you bring greed means you are going to control, manipulate and you are going to be infatuated. You are going to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, mentally sick. You don't know the boundary of that uh, sensual pressure. All that happened from greed part. So what the Buddha says is, don't bring greed to sensual pleasure. So attachment is uh, built in uh, in the in the experience of the sensual pleasure. Now, say for instance, uh, in regard to your mother and father, we are you are emotionally attached to them. You can't let it go. That's why you cry when they pass away. That's why you even do uh, dana and uh, all this ancestral stuff. But greed, greed is a problem. So, uh, try to minimize the greed. Greed is also slowly forming. If you are not properly taking the right measures, slowly, behind the scene, it's forming slowly. Unless we are mindful about it. So, what the Buddha says here is that, no, I mean, I'm trying to go back to the thing that I was trying to say. When you read Buddhism, if you are not a Buddhist as well, so there are a lot of non-Buddhists. When they get to hear about Buddhism, there's a strong misconception about Buddhism, so-called Buddhism. It is that Buddha denies enjoying sensual pleasures for the lay people. This sutta is living proof. <coughs> As you can see, householder, these four kinds of happiness can be earned by a lay person who enjoy sensual pleasures. He did not condemn about it. For the lay people, for the monks, it's a different thing. Yes, <laughs> it, it's their life. You don't have to mix, uh, mix with the monk's life, with your life. Okay. Now, what's happening is that a lot of uh, Dhamma speakers are sharing monastic suttas with the lay people and asking them to be a monastic. <laughs> In a different way. They have to teach lay people's suttas. This is one of the suttas. So, that's a misconception. I'm going to dispel that now. That's why I shared with you. Lately, I saw a book, very famous book. In that book, there is a certain, uh, what you call, a motto at the beginning. What does it say? It's about Dhamma, you know, the whole book. If you really want to minimize suffering, you should leave out all the ownership that you have. Now, how do we look at this teaching with that understanding? Now, the book was written for lay people. That was taken from a Sangha perspective about their own monastic life and their journey. So we have to understand that going back, a lay person is supposed to enjoy happiness of ownership. Let's look at it. What is the happiness of ownership? It is when a gentleman owns legitimate wealth. Uh, in order for you to own legitimate wealth, you have to be a gentleman, right? <laughs> Well, that he has earned by his own efforts and initiative, we can take from the uh, woman perspective too, built up with his own hands, gathered by the sweat of the bro. When he reflects on this, he is filled with pleasure and happiness. This is called the happiness of ownership. Second is that being able to enjoy that. Third is that you are using conditions with regard to the finances and getting all those things, loans and all that. But you know how to wisely use them. I think I, I bring uh, technology to this part mm. because we cannot avoid technological impact. We have to embrace it. But don't become vulnerable to the addiction part of the technology. That is why I was uh, using this part. Uh, so 
this is an interesting sutta about your own uh, happiness in your daily life. So try to uh, be happy if you can under these four types of happiness before you look for the nippa. <laughs> that is the high happiness. And you can't go to uh, taking a PhD without a bachelor's degree, without a master, never ever think about it. So these happiness types are lay people's happiness, they must uh, earn them before, before they think about uh, that kind of a higher level of happiness. So uh, technology and addiction to technology and gadgets have to be understood uh, with the third happiness over here because uh, we cannot deny them. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Bhante, for the uh, deeper clarification. Two things that I need to follow up, I wish to follow up. One is, what is the source of this um, translation, which is very closely to what Bhante has just explained to us? Uh, this this, okay, I, I chose a Sutta Central. Okay. Uh, this translation is by uh, Bhante Sujat. Okay, there are a couple translations. Little better than all the <laughs> translation at this point. But sometimes, some translations of XYZ uh, writers are not good. Sometimes it's good. It depends on, like when I look at uh, a sutta, I normally go by the Pali. I don't look at translation at, uh, in the, uh, at the beginning. I check the uh, Pali first, then I translate in my own way. Then I check English. Oh, okay. But right? Otherwise, you might go to English. Ah, okay, Pali should be the same. That's so, why, yeah. Okay, on this note, right, before I go to my second uh, question is that, is there any link that Bante can provide to us, right, which is at least safest to the extent that Bante has checked to be reliable translation? <laughs> uh, it's very hard to say because sometimes a good translator is going to be a bad translator in the next week. Okay. So it's, Understand. <laughs> it's, <laughs> Impermanence. it's very hard. It depends on uh, different suttas translations. Uh, now here, I think this is a little better. But uh, if I were to do this translation, it's going to be very different. Uh, because all these are Westerners. Uh, they they, they uh, learn uh, Pali from English. Now, if we take a uh, person from Sanskrit or from Sinhala language, Pali, Sanskrit, they are very similar, you know, uh, to translate this thing and then to look at it. It might be very different. So, uh, Sometimes they are good, sometimes not. It depends on the certain translation. Uh, but for this sutta, this is little better than other translations. How about Bhante yourself? Do you have any link that we can assess to to see your translation? Uh, <laughs> not yet. I'm uh, yeah in the activity okay, at the moment. Sadhu, yes, sadhu, sadhu yes. for that. Okay, yes. my, my second question follow up from what Bhante explained, right? Am I correct to say that well, thank God, would have allowed us to have sensual pleasure, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm so happy yet. You, you felt a relief feeling. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> but okay. be careful without lowering greed. Yes. I think you can, you can love people without greed. You can take care of them without greed. That's, that's where I'm coming that's to. That's important. That's very interesting. Yes. When you say sensual pleasure is a package deal with attachment. Okay. That's it very built in. Attachment is built in. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That that really very comforting. <laughs> yeah. But you mentioned something that we should not introduce, or we try not to, or learn not to introduce greed. Yeah, greed. So am I? Am I? Is my understanding correct by saying that do not have expectations while we enjoy whatever sensual pleasures that's ongoing that conditions permit within our space? We should have this understanding that everything is impermanence is due to its causes and conditions, and hence. Have that understanding, of course, um, at this point of time, it will be intellectual understanding from what we pick up from Bhante and for other, uh, other teaching, right? Um, do not have the kind of expectation that it is going to be permanent, you can control it, you can create more of this. Is, is that where, is that how aware that the, the teaching is guiding us to without I, expectation? I think... Uh... It depends on the certain relationship. Now, say for instance, there is a new couple who are dating and who are planning to marry or who are newly married, whatever. I think, uh, as you may understand, uh, they have this uh, uh, give and take. Give and take mentality. Somebody is uh, 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 somebody is sacrificing 
uh, financially and time-wise, the other person does not do that, right? Other person is always taking uh, the other person's activities for granted. So how to uh, go ahead in that relationship? So I think without expectation part is also a higher level of understanding. I think initially uh, the compromise, a good conversation between each other, an informed relationship, a mutual understanding, these are the things we have to talk about, right? So, when you are in a relationship, can you be in a relationship without expectations, to be honest? It's going to be such a very uh, misunderstanding. Then better not to become a part of a relationship, be single forever, being on the side, right? Not even <clears throat> relationship. Think about mother, father, parents and children. Now, when, when one of them uh, is going to pass away, how many children are struggling for the funeral cost? How many children are struggling for the uh, hospital bills? And these are real problems in our life. There may be a good Samaritan in that family. Yeah, I'll take care of all the bills, you know, don't worry. You know, right? Because I can do that. But what I'm trying to say is that there are expectations. Parents expect, if possible, children will take care of them. That's why we raise them. Children might ask, we didn't ask you to bring us. <laughs> But, I mean, the modern children sometimes. But what we understand is that expectations are involved in different ways. So, let's come to real life. Not those teachings on different places. Huh? Let's come to the real life. In real life, I think in order for any relationship, parents, children, uh, partners, uh, others, for all relationships, uh, there are certain expectations, but those expectations are not unhealthy. I think they are part of our mutual understanding. Say, for instance, someone is to come to BGF. BGF has their own etiquette, their own operations. Doesn't that person respect? Shouldn't that person respect that uh, code of etiquette? So they expect that. They have to expect. If you go to another uh, place, Let's say you go to a uh, mall, you go to a, another office, government office. Right? There are certain things, they are, these are expected, they are not harmful stuff, just to keep our rapport, keep our understanding. Now say for instance, um, relationship, anything, there are certain expectations. But as you continue to grow with people, you may find out some people are not going to be changed. Mm. They don't want to compromise for us. Mm. They have already come to our life. Mm. Now you cannot go out also. Mm. You cannot break up. You cannot uh, divorce. Things have passed. The time has passed. Then that understanding can be brought up. The one you just now said, okay, mm. I do things without expect. This is my part. Uh, I'm not expecting anything from that person. That, that could be a good thing. Right? Because we are sometimes dealing with people whom we cannot change in our life. But we cannot even go out of that relationship for the sake of children, for the sake of uh, maybe we don't have enough time to think about another life, uh, maybe financial issues. Uh, so I think, uh, but if we bring uh, an, uh, an idea that we do everything without expectations, that might not work in the real life. Uh, but let's say you pick up dana practice, do dana, practice meditation, then you should do those activities without any expectation. Then you are right. Yes. You bring dana to the vihara and you are thinking, uh, may I be able to become the largest deva in the Tavat in the heaven? Next slide. Because I offered dana to the venerable man. Then you are creating an expectation which is not nice. Because uh, merits of the dana are complementary. You don't have to expect them, right? And uh, you are practicing meditation, all that. So, uh, at that point, expectations are unnecessary. You should not make them. But in your normal, secular, mundane life, uh, even you don't expect, other people expect from you. Yes. You might say, I'm not expecting, but other people expect you. So then, 
when you don't expect, when other people expect from you, you cannot go up in a society, that family circle. So then you have to uh, deal with these expectations mm. in the proper way, mm. become a nice person in that family, maybe financially, maybe uh, uh, your relationship wise. So I think that is how uh, we are going to look at it. And don't bring all the hardcore Dhamma into the mundane life in one night. Your mundane life will be destroyed. That hardcore Dhamma has to be applied at the right time, at the right place. So how would one day... Um, I know it's not your, your only thought. This is the thought of many people out there. So that's yeah. what we are dispelling. You know? Yes. Yes. How, how would one how would day um, advise, right? When you say do not introduce greed into the sensual pleasure that comes with attachment. What is this do not introduce greed? In what sense in our mundane life, yeah. in the lay life now? Yes. Can you give some examples? Yeah, lower, Pali word lower is the greed. So this greed is, you don't have to introduce, it is, it is latent. It is latent in your mentality. It's sleeping. Time to time it sleeps, time to time it wakes up. So uh, what we have to understand here is that um, you are not introducing, you have to lower it, you have to minimize it. Now say for instance, there is a couple, very good example. Now uh, there is someone in the relationship who is very much into the other person uh, emotionally. Then this person is going to uh, dislike, even the other person is talking to the opposite gender. Hey, you can't talk. Huh? You can't talk. I don't like that. Right? So that means that normal attachment to the love has gone into a certain form of greed, right? Uh, controlling, controlling part. And, and the person feels, I have no voice in this relationship. Every time I talk, uh, I'll be shut down by the other person. And then there is a greed that has come onto the relationship. But there's someone who is loving very well, letting you speak, letting you understand, also doing his part and you do your part, everything is mutual, wonderful relationship, understanding, discussing together, sit together, spend more time together, then you can uh, reduce that lower part. Mm. What about parents and children? Uh, there, is, uh, there is a parent uh, who likes only one child in the family, uh, always appreciating only that child. right? Maybe uh, mother likes the youngest son, right? Maybe the last one to uh, give birth. So others feeling a little bit upset about it. But they have to do their things to the mother, right? Uh, at that point, uh, mother has to understand, if, if she wants to understand Buddhism, I have to treat every kid uh, in the same way, right? In the same way. So th these are the things that uh, you can understand about the greed part. Mm. I mean, the greed is always there. You can minimize all the time. Yeah. So when you say minimize, right? This means this is where the critical thinking, the discernment comes in. That whether it is beneficial to what we call overboard, cross the line. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. That critical you. thinking is not coming when we are addicted to technology. Thank you. Right. Okay. All right, we can take maybe one or two more questions and we will wrap this up. Namo Dayavate. Yeah, Namo Dayavate. Um, I have a question. You mentioned that uh, as lay people, we should enjoy uh, sexual pleasure, right? Uh, I mean, not, even, not I say, the Buddha say. Oh, the Buddha say, yeah, don't, sorry. Don't try to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Buddha say it and there's a yeah. sutta for it. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm i seeing a contradiction. I mean, like, um, like you said, like, uh, monks and lay people are different. But in the end, like, if we want to attain Nibbana, like, we, we need to let it go, right? So, um, how won't it backfire if we enjoy sexual pleasure? Because, like, and then you also mentioned that don't enjoy sensual pleasure uh, with greed. But isn't it bound to have greed some way or another when we're enjoying sensual pleasure? In order to understand this, this uh, context, I would like to ask you to think about different people, 
now as we said in order to attain nibbana we have to let go of even the karma sensual pleasures at a certain point mm. that is at that point let's say not every lay person would like to do that mm. are they i don't think so but there may be a couple of serious lay people who want to do that then okay? they should become monks and nuns be a part of that process mm. why they want to uh, let go of all the sensual pleasures while being a lay person that can really make a lot of chaos to the other people in the family right so it's better to uh, become serious in that thought and become a monk and nun be a part of that group but if you are a lay person if you are not going to be a monk nun why you have to do that you are ruining your lay life you are you are destroying your other people in the family so a monk should not be a lay person a lay person should not be a monk right we don't have to complicate these things so uh, if you, if they are serious they have to become as such at a certain point and then to uh, do the process so we have to separate this out these are two separate groups but majority of them if you ask them personally they say we want to be happy we want to lead a happy life mm. right so then yeah these are the teachings that's how we going to look at it so there is no uh, complication uh, complication arises when uh, two uh, monks and nuns and lay people at the same time trying to attain nibbana right so just to follow up so if there's a case um actually lay pe- lay people shouldn't even read the suttas for monks is it i think they sh- they are not supposed to uh, in the first place Uh, with some information further study they can read but in the first place they should understand read the suttas for the lay people because they were meant for lay people let's say there is a lay person who directly jumps onto a very high end hardcore dhamma teaching in a monk based monastic sutta i think that is not a good attempt right Okay, lastly, may I know how to know which sutta is for lay people and which sutta are for monks? That's why you have to approach people like us. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do a drop off addition to this understanding. Today, Anana Sutta, this is one sutta. There are many other suttas, not 20, not 30, more than 50. So we have to learn them. That is how we are going to understand, especially you are going to understand your lay life. So you won't find them online. There are suttas, but you don't know who, who was the target audience. Only when you approach a dharma teacher, proper dharma teacher, he or she will tell you, "Ah, read this sutta, that sutta, this sutta." Has anybody ever found this sutta before? <laughs> ah, some of them maybe, uh, some of them not. All right. So I think thank you, uh, then we will wrap this up. Uh, right, Brother Bobby. Most of the time. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, Bhante, yeah, for the questions. Dhamma sharing, very beneficial. Okay. Okay. So today we've been discussing about a little bit uh, dif- uh, different topic: uh, digital addiction. Uh, what we said was that we need dig- digital presence in order to do our things in our daily life. Definitely, but never ever become addicted because it can ruin our. Uh, life mundane uh, extra mundane life so may all the uh, uh, good karmas you've been making today by learning understanding engaging in a discussion like this be transferred to all the departed ones who passed away in the name of all of us may they be well and happy may they attain the supreme bliss of nepal sadhu 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 idam me nyati nang hutu sukita huntu nyatayo idam me nyati nang hutu sukita huntu nyatayo idam me nyati nang hutu sukita huntu nyatayo at the same time me deva naga mahitika all the non human beings receive all these good karmas may they be well and happy may they protect and bless all of us for good health quality of life prosperity and safety may they in particular bless our dharma journeys finally may devanaga mahidika also attain the supreme bliss of nibbana sadhu 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 ittavata ch ammi sambhadang punya sampadang
Sabi deva anumu dantu sabi bhuta anumu dantu sabi satta anumu dantu sabi sang pati sindhya aka satta cibum matta deva naga mahindika punyantang anumu ditwa cirang rakang tulu kesa senang cirang rakang tuli senang cirang rakang tumang paranti cirang rakang tutwan sadati at the same time we are making a great wish which uh, has been in our regular practice at the end of all good karmas we are wishing may we be able to be in the company of kalyanamittas noble friends till we attain nibbana noble friends uh, do help us uh, in sustaining deepening maintaining our dhamma practice solo meditation solo dhamma practice is not enough so we need to be influence motivated by others at the same time thinking thus we're going to make this wish imina punya kamene mami bal samagamu satang samagamu hutu yavani pana patya finally may all the good karmas which we'll be making today be supportive and helpful for all of us to attain the supreme bliss of nibbana sadhu Sadhu, sadhu. Abhivadana silis nichang vadha pacha inu chattaru dhamma vadhanti ayuvanu sukhang balang ayuraru ke sampati sagh sang pati me vich atu nibbana sampati iminati samichatu sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, that's the end.